We're starting a series today. We're starting a series today titled The Power and the Purpose of the New Covenant. The Power and the Purpose of the New Covenant. And it's going to be a four week series. Now, this is very important because many believers are not living in the covenant that was designed for them. Many have even said that they are confused about the Bible. Some people even say that there is a whole bunch of contradictions in the Bible because they don't understand the covenants. For instance, when you look at Matthew 7, the Bible says that forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. That says you f- it's when you forgive others that God will forgive you. It says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against you. Well, in the book of Ephesians 4.32, the Bible says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. One is saying, Go and forgive others so I can forgive you. One is, the other is saying, you have been forgiven. Go and forgive others. It's not the same. It's different. And this is just one example. There are so many. And people get confused. Oh, why do we have so many traditions? Because they don't understand dispensations. They don't understand that there is a covenant that God was operating before. And there is a covenant that is operating now. And you can't mix and match both. You can't pick from here and pick from here and pick from here and say, after all, it's the word of God. No, it doesn't work that way. There is a covenant for you. And I'm trusting God that this month you will understand the blessedness of the new covenant. Our text is from Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. And I want you to follow me. Let's read together. It says, the day is coming says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. These covenants will not be like the one I made with the ancestors. It's different. This covenant will not be like the one I made with the ancestors. It's a different covenant. When I took them from the hand, by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, they broke that covenant. Do I love them as the husband loved his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbor, nor to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. Verse 31, first of all, says, I will make a new covenant. Verse 32 says, it is not like the one I made before. That means this covenant is entirely different from the one that God operated before. And I will put them deep within their hearts. So for this week, we'll be talking about leap from performance to acceptance. And you have to follow me because I'm going to be doing some studies. It's not the usual preaching. You have to follow me because I want you to see something with your eyes. And you need to appreciate the covenant that we are running now. Now let's look at that Jeremiah 31-34. It says, and they will not need to teach their neighbor, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatness will know me, sorry, to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. Now, why is God saying he will not remember the sins? Under the old covenant, the high priest, if you look at the book of Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 11, the high priest will go and make sacrifice for the sins of the people. 
every year. It, on a yearly basis, he would offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. He would use bulls and goats and several other things to make those sacrifices. Under the new covenant, Jesus came and he offered his blood once and for all. And because of that, the issue of sin has been dealt with forever. Under the old covenant, because they have to come yearly, even though you forget, when it is time to come again, you have to remember. Under the new covenant, Christ offered his blood once and for all. Now, what is a covenant? A covenant is, covenant is something that God initiated after the fall of man. And it's a basis or framework within which God will relate with man. A covenant is like an agreement. Let me just give an example. Just like you have a contract. It's a kind of a covenant. When you go and get a loan from a bank. And you say, I will pay so, so, and so, at so, so, and so time. And you may need to get a collateral and give the bank. And you you agree and you sign. That's like a covenant. Or your employment letter. You say, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what the employer is going to do. The employer is going to give me this amount of money every month or every year. And the man will say, okay, this is what I expect you to do. And then you sign it. Those are small examples, very, very small examples, but not even as strong as covenants. But just for you to appreciate how covenants are made. A covenant is an agreement entered into by two or more parties by which the mode of operation, the method of engagement, the rights and the responsibilities of each party are determined. Now, on that, in the Bible, covenants were usually ratified with the spilling and the shedding of blood. When you look at the Bible, there are about seven covenants. Seven. And what I see believers do is that they say, is the Bible, they even call it the word of God. So they up around from, from the Adamic covenant to the Noahic covenant to the Abrahamic covenant to the Davidic covenant to the, the Mosaic covenant and to the new covenant. They just mix it. There is a covenant for you. You cannot, it's just like you had a, an employment with a Jakarta Bank. And I had my employment with Jalingo Bank. I cannot use Jakarta Bank terms and conditions to work in Jalego Bank. They will fire me. I, I, I wonder who it may be. I don't have that covenant, that, that contract. It is you that signed that contract. You cannot afford to be running a covenant that was made for Jews. You are not a Jew. You cannot afford to run a covenant that was made for another set of people in the world, that's not who you are. You are a believer. There is a covenant. Because, listen, I'm saying this because over 80% of those I've met, because of my own survey, they are not living the new covenant. They are living on another covenant that God is not operating anymore. And they are forcing and getting God to want to perform, to move, based on something that is not the base of agreement between themselves and God. So there is a mismatch. And their sentences are not working. Everything is difficult. It cannot work. That contract is no longer existing. Let me give you an example of a covenant that God enacted with Noah. Genesis chapter 9, verse 11. Genesis chapter 9, verse 11. It says, yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. He says, I am confirming my covenant with you. And if you go to verse 12, it says, I'm giving you a sign of my covenant with you and all living creatures for all generations to come. It says, I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It's a sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. So that is a covenant with Noah and all creatures. And God said, I will never again destroy the world with flood. There were other co covenants that were conditional. 
And those were conditional covenants whereby there are something you need to fulfill before God fulfills something. Once you do that, God will do his own part, especially the Mosaic covenants. A lot of people go to the Bible, for instance, and go to Deuteronomy 11 and read blessings to themselves. You do not read the beginning part. <laughs> and the end. Because the beginning part will say, if you do this, it's conditional. This is what will happen to you. You skip that part. You just went straight to the blessing and begin to claim it. You are not serious. But God is looking at you. What kind of human being is this person? And we do that a lot in the church. And we are claiming it. And we are claiming with power. But there was a condition attached to it. In fact, everything in the covenant of Moses was conditional. Every, there was nothing that was just happening free. It was conditional. It was based on performance. There is something that you will need to do. I would have loved to show you example how it happened in the book of Exodus 24 from verse 4 to 8. But because of my time, I will not go there. Just write it and read it later. Exodus 4, 4 to 8. But let's go to Exodus 11, verse 26. The one that I would normally go and read and enjoy and claim. See the way he said it. It says, look, today I am giving you a choice between a blessing and a curse. Verse 27. You will be blessed if, mm, if that condition is clear, you obey the commands that I'm give, that of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. But you will be cursed if you reject the commands of the Lord your God and turn away from him and worship gods that you have not known before. This covenant was based on performance. You will be blessed if you obey. You will be cursed if you don't obey. Now, what people do is that they leave that if and this blessed part. They now go to the middle part. Read those things for themselves. Claim it in the name of Jesus. I declare, forget that thing. The Bible was written in context. There is an if. And guess what? That was not meant for you. This was a covenant that was based on performance. Listen, I know we always quote Joshua 1 8 a lot. But really and truly, Joshua 1 8 is not really for the believer. There are principles in the New Testament that we can relate to it regarding meditation, and which is powerful. But Joshua 1 it says, This book of the law shall not depart. What is the book of the law? The Mosaic Covenant. Book of the law. Not just any book. Book of the law. Fine. I can tell you that even in the New Testament, it requires us to study, to meditate, so it's powerful. The principles we apply. But this one was talking about book of the law. It is part of the Mosaic Covenant. It is performance. In fact, it was just repeating what was in Deuteronomy. That if you do this, this will happen. It was based on performance. But under the New Testament, it is not based on performance. It is based on acceptance. Ephesians 1.3. Can we look at it together? Ephesians 1 3. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Why? Why? Because we are united with Christ. Under the old covenant, you will be blessed if you obey. All the commands that I have given you. Under the new covenant, you have been blessed because of acceptance of Jesus. Because you are united with Jesus. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Look at verse 6 of that same Ephesians 1. If you can show it to us in the KJV, that will also be powerful. It says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. It's based on acceptance. He made us accepted. When you accepted Jesus Christ, you were accepted into the beloved. These were given to you because of your acceptance of Jesus, not because of your performance. It is important that you know the difference. It's not the same. Because a lot of people are missing it up. Second Peter 1 3. 
It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Jesus. By coming to know him. It's acceptance based on faith in Christ Jesus. The old covenant was based on performance. The new covenant is based on acceptance of what Christ did. As a matter of fact, if you check very well, God is no longer blessing people per se. God blessed people. We are only appropriating the blessing. He blessed in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.3. Look at it again. Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, past tense, not present tense. Because many Christians don't read Bible in tenses. Anyone, present, past, is the word of God. <laughs> everything is the word of God. We don't read everything. If you say past, right? no, if the Bible says blessed, it is done. If it says it's past tense, it is past tense. Now look at it, it says you have been blessed with Every spiritual blessing. What did you do to qualify for that? You just accepted and you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Every. No one left. You did not do anything. Now let me ask you a question. What you are trying to get now, what are you doing to achieve it? You know, we have this performance mindset. That God wants to help us to position in the right place. I'm not talking that performance is good. I'm coming to that. But there is a place you place performance. Be careful you don't place it at the wrong place. You cannot place it as that is what is making you to get things with God. That's what is giving you qualification before God. That's what's giving you local standing before God. Romans 8:32. The Bible says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up freely for us all. Won't he also give us everything else? In other words, God gave us his best in Christ Jesus. Will he not give you the rest? The best I gave to you, what did you do to qualify for it? Just accepted Jesus. What about the rest? You want to suffer. You want to kill. You want to fire. You want to fight. Battle. We have performance mindset. Listen, the whole covenant was based on performance. This one, he did, not, he did not spare his son. He gave you his best. Tell me what you need in life that is up to Jesus. And he's saying, will he not give you the rest? But we don't, when we want to approach the rest, <laughs> fire, <laughs> it is power. It is fight. It is battle. It's a mindset that we need to address because that mindset was the Mosaic Covenant. That's not the covenant that God is running with you. And let me say this very clearly. This covenant is the last covenant. After this, God did not release any other covenant again. Any covenant that showed up in the world after Jesus is false. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. This is the last covenant. Because today, every, the people are still speaking up new religions. Saying that they have a covenant. It says, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken past tense. To us through his son, God promised everything to the son as an inheritance, and through the son, create the universe. If everything is now wrapped in the son, which one is left for him to do again? This is the last covenant. Everything. Some people are still bringing up new covenants after Jesus. This is the last. He says, He has spoken. He has spoken. God did not just replace the law with a new law. He replaced it with a person, Jesus. And he said, follow him. Follow him. God is no longer speaking except through Jesus. I say it again. You didn't get it. 
I say God is no longer speaking except truth. In other words, everything that God says now must be in alignment with what Joshua has spoken. If it's not in alignment, God has not spoken. This is the last covenant. And that's why under this covenant you can hear God yourself. What we read earlier on, it says in the past, he spoke through prophets. Under the Old Testament, you want to do something, you go and meet the prophet. What is God saying? Oh, David, I'm going to battle. Abitai, 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 have you already called his name? Abitai, he says, should I go or should I not go? The guy will do his consultation and say, thus says the Lord. <laughs> you can go. He will say, pursue and overtake all. Ha, fine, we are going. Under the new covenant, you have direct access to God. You don't need to go through another person for God to hear you. Because God has no grandchildren. He only has sons. You don't go through another son. You have direct access to God. We must cherish what we have. Some of you believe that the prayer of the man of God is stronger than your prayer. If you believe it is being it unto you. According to your words. It is under the new covenant, no believer has access to God more than another believer. Ideally, no believer's prayer should be more powerful than the other. The reason why a man of God prayer, so that you come and I pray and it's, it's happened and you are struggling, is because maybe by experience, I've worked with God. I've learned to trust and I love to depend on him. I know the value of the access that I have. You don't know the value. So when you come to me, I will go to God with that value and knowledge of the access. It doesn't mean that I have special place. In my father's house, there is a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I who has a place in your father's house in this place? You have a place in your father's house in this place? Some of you want to get married. Or when marriage is getting delayed, you're not going to meet one baba. He'll tell you to bring five names. Let him tell you the person without breaking names. <laughs> <laughs> eh? he, will not, he will not touch. I told you one day that even a child can pick one out of five. Don't, don't think required. You now go to a prophet. Say, bring five names. Three names. You now pick one. Say, baba has chosen. You now enter marriage and you're having a problem. You now come to church. Come, we'll help you. <laughs> this is the house of God. We can solve all problems. It's not, there's nothing wrong to come. But I'm saying you can avoid all those things. Stop going through mediums. Some believers here are still consulting Abalis. Not here. Some believers. And, and, are you here? Yeah. I'm not sure you are here. But I tell you, some believers are still consulting Abalis. The, the guy is doing sacrifice. After Jesus' sacrifice, he said, Go and bring dove and your grandmother's head. And uh, who, have, who have gone before? Tell me what they asked to bring. <laughs> who have gone before? Because I've never gone, but I heard this. Who has gone? Some of us should be proud that God has saved us. If you have gone before, before you led Christ, let us hear the Jesus. Let me see your hand up. You are not bold about what. Me, if I went, I will, you thought I would say it. I did bad, bad things when I was in the world, but I didn't reach that level. But if you have. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody here they say you gotta bring something? You gotta bring your grandmother's teeth. You gotta bring this thing. They will not do sacrifice for you. No sacrifice again after Jesus Christ died and rose again. We must appreciate what we have. We have believers today going to consult other mediums, not knowing that they have the most powerful connection that exists. The God of the universe is your father. Is your father. You have direct access. To him. We can hear God by ourselves. In Matthew 17, 1, the Bible says that after six days, it says Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and the brothers of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. Then there was a transfigured, there, sorry, there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then, there appeared before him Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, 
Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my soul, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. You have Moses, the one that gave you the law. But that time is gone. Listen to this one. Moses and Elijah represented the whole covenant, the whole covenant. He said, "Listen to Jesus now. Listen to him now. That time is gone." Many people don't just mix in everything together. Yes, they went for Winsome. Winsome is our corporate evangelism in, in CTC, and we go every first Saturday of the month to evangelize as a team. And yesterday we went both in Lekki, in Yaba, in Manchester Chapel. We all went to we, we preach the gospel. If you not come, you missed a lot. I met a guy. And I, of course, we don't, we, when we go meet people, we don't let them know I come to preach. We just go and start gisting with them. And say, how are you doing? Fine. How is life? Everything. He say, ah, now God, oh, they look. Ah, I say, God. Ah, when you say, ah, you open the door for me. I say, God. God. Why? I said, do you know God and are you able to relate with God? Ah, He said, well, there is one God and I reuse all the three available means to reach him. Ah. <laughs> that was a discovery for me. So I said, what are the three available means to reach this God? He said, Christian, Christianity, Muslim, and traditional worship. And you are using the three to, to reach God? He said, yes. I said, have you ever seen a door that three keys can open it? Three different keys. This is the door. You take one key, you put, you enter. Then another key, you put. You say, I have the palock is spoiled. <laughs> so you see your Nigerian mentality. Our God is not spoiled. <laughs> you know, if you are in Nigeria, your, your brain has, sometimes Gary has entered the brain. You don't know. How can you be thinking like that? He said, the door is spoiled. I said, well, our God is not spoiled. There is only one key that opens that door, and that key is Jesus. This guy, he says, a choir member in his church. There is going for choir practice that evening. And he used the three bees. <laughs> That's why, guys, we need to preach the gospel. People are suffering. People don't know the truth. How can somebody be a choir member? And he's using, he says he's using three means to reach God, even traditional. <laughs> Many people think that God will still speak through some prophets. After Jesus, no prophet. God has spoken. God has spoken. Jesus Christ gave us access to God forever. And that's why we must always be excited and give him thanks. We must be careful not to reduce our Christianity to the level of performance only. Because it was acceptance that gave us access to everything that we have. For instance, I've seen somebody that said, in fact, it was a word of knowledge I gave in the church. So there's somebody here, you keep thinking that the sins you committed before you gave your life to Christ is haunting you. And that you are cursed before you met Jesus. And when you look at your life today, it's not working well. You say the course is following you. And I pray for the person. The person came to me after service. She said, I will not lie to you. I was a very bad boy as a young boy. My father cursed me. My mother cursed me. Now, every time I see my life, I think it's that course that is coming to pass. I said, no. If you are in Christ Jesus, the course is gone. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. Listen, we must appreciate what we have when we come to Jesus. Do not think that the things you did in your past is haunting you. And I'm talking to somebody in this place. Sometimes we still think that that thing that we did is why we are still here. That thing is what is haunting me. No. God is seeing you like someone who never sinned before when you came to Jesus. He's giving you a brand new start. He's giving you a brand new start. And I told the person... If that's what you are thinking, it will happening to you. You know, if you see yourself that you are cursed and you are a machine of cost, you will be, cost will be flowing. It's your mind that is bringing about those things. 
take it away from your mind. Under this new covenant, I approach God based on acceptance and not based on performance. That is why these days, many believers do great things and they forget that it's not even the great thing that you did. It's what Jesus did. You know you can easily forget. For instance, you, a lot of people are trusting God for things and they go and fast. 21 days fasting. Dry fasting, some people. Some people, it wet. Some people, they are fasting and they are eating. But they just call it fasting. And then you say, God, I've fasted. I've tried. I've performed. Even though you are wicked, with what I have done, you should have conscience. <laughs> I've tried. Now, Father, look down from the throne upon the neglect of food that I have gone through and show that thou art a merciful God. I've tried. I've performed. Now you perform. Fasting is powerful. Fasting is great. In this place we fast. In this place we pray every three hours. But that is not what qualifies you access to the throne of grace. Nothing you can ever do that is worth more than the blood of Jesus Christ. You fast because you want to avoid distraction to focus on your God, not to get a qualification for God to assess, answer your prayers. Some people even say, Lord, wake up in the middle of the night, 12 midnight. You call it midnight prayers. God, I'm not sure you answer day prayers. Like midnight. Midnight. Ah, when you are sleeping, I woke up. I need business. Because it is in the middle of the night. Father, I've tried. Perform. Listen, that middle of the night in your country is 6 a.m. in that country. <laughs> Some even pull their clothes. And I did that before God. I'm confessing now. You Middle of the night, around 12 midnight, you pull all your clothes. You say, Father, as you brought me, I present myself to you. <laughs> as though God does see everything that is under. As, as you are now, whatever is under, God is seeing it. Anything you have, whether asset or liability, God can see it. He's seen everything. Everything is laid bare before his eyes. With whom we have to do. If you like wear 79 clothes, God still see under. So why do you want to remove your clothes and say, Father, as, I, as you sent me, I came to you the same way. In the middle of the night, now you have to perform. Performance mentality. Hebrews 4.14. Hebrews 4.14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we process. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet it did not sin. Verse 16 says it very clearly. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace in the time of need. Can we please go to NLT? So let us come boldly to the throne of grace our gracious God and will receive mercy and find grace to help when we need it the most. Come what? Boldly. Somebody say boldly. Why should you come boldly? Because your high priest has gone for you. Not because you went midnight. Not because you are naked. Some people say, Lord, I'm on the mountain. I'm not on the ground floor. This one is closer to you. So you got to perform. Not because of that. Now, we are not trying to undermine performance. But under the New Testament, performance is not a qualification. It's an expression. Which means your performance is expressing who you are, not something that qualifies you before God. 
you will perform, but never see your performance at what gives you access to God. A lot of people are complaining in church. That guy that I met, you know what he told me? I said, are you sure you are, why are you uh, correct to God? He said, I give my tithe and offering, and I try to serve God. I have some people that are going to pray and say, somebody, there was a lady that got married, no children for some time. And every time she goes to God, say, Lord! <laughs> this one she told me. Say, Apostle, when I was in school, in my room, all of them were doing runs. They were carrying guys. They were dropping them every weekend. Only me, I stay praying to the Lord. Serving the living God. <laughs> now, they all have children. In essence, me, I don't have one. And I kept myself. I met as a virgin. So now, I've performed. God performed. Maybe those people that have perf- they've performed lowly, then one day they go to God and say, Father, help me. <laughs> I know I have sinned against you. I know I was a Ross girl. Aristo girl. People use me. And now I want to change. Father, forgive me. She will be accepted in the beloved. You, you see, Father, I tried. I kept myself. I did not do this. I kept it. I covered it. I sealed up. Brethren, it is good to seal up. And thou must seal up. Did you hear what I just said? Don't go and say, ah, ah, this person is a Christian, so we do it today. It's not this part of, it's not this part of God that is talking that one, no. Thou must what? Seal up. But don't take care that seal it up as the access to God. Go with Jesus. <laughs> work hard. Don't take your work in hard as the access to God. Give well. Don't say, but God, I have given. How come we have not? Some people are here. They are still saying, but God, with all I have done, why am I at this level? You are approaching God with performance. Nothing you will ever do is worth up to the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Beloved, Christianity was not meant to be difficult. It's because we went under the Mosaic Covenant and we saw that if you do this, I will do this. You now think it's the same. Join everything together. Now you have been accepted in the beloved. I'm not saying you should not perform. You must perform. But don't see your performance as your qualification before God. See it as an expression of who you are. Let me conclude by us reading this verse of scripture together. Everybody, we're going to read together now. Hebrews 8, 6. Let's all read together. But now, Jesus, let's go. Our high priest has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God, based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But when God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the arm and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbor. Nor will they need to teach their relatives saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. And I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remain, remember their sins. Verse 13, when God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. It's the same Bible, the same Bible, the word of God. Obsolete, disappear. The Bible itself tells you that the dispensation has changed. 
You can't be cherry picking from every part of the scripture and trying to force yourself into it. That was not the covenant made for you. It's like you are working in a place. They are paying you $10,000 per annum. And now you get another place where they are paying you $10 billion per annum. And you say, okay, I like this place, but I, I like the entertainment allowance of the former one. And I like the dressing allowance of this former one. Then this other one, I like the basic package is good. Then you want to join it together. It can't work. You are either in this employment or you are in this employment. Listen to this. The covenant we have is the best, most powerful, based on better promises. Think about it. The Jews operated the whole covenant. Even in the world today, they stand out. Do you know that? Even some pastors teach Jewish code for doing business. <laughs> An average Jew is well to do. An average Jew does very well. They prosper, they flourish. It shows in their life that they understood in covenant that God operates on time. The Jews have won Nobel laureate prize more than any other country. They have technology that is well advanced. It is obvious that these people have tasted a covenant. Believers who have a better covenant, many of us are not even up to a Jew when we look at our lives. We don't even reason up to that. The way we fear, the way we, the way we, 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 we are sluggish, the way we don't move with the pace that God will have us to move, we are even performing worse than Jews who operated a covenant that is obsolete and has disappeared. You operate the real, fresh, new covenant of God and the last covenant of God and the best covenant of God. Your life should show forth the covenant that you are in. This is the best covenant. This month, we will delve into it. I welcome you to a wonderful time in the Holy Ghost. This is a wonderful life. The real covenant. Oh, I'm a child of God. Yes, I